They say that there are three certainties in life. Death, taxes, and championship football clubs lurching from crisis to crisis. For much of the past decade, Reading FC have been one of the division's biggest crisis clubs of all, amidst some formidable competition. Since John Mareski sold Reading in 2012, bringing the curtain down on his 22 years as chairman, during which time the Royals were hailed as one of the best-run clubs in England, Reading have had one Premier League relegation, five championship relegation scraps, one unsuccessful playoff campaign, a two-year transfer ban, a six-point deduction, three different owners, and 15 different managers, all in the space of just 11 years. Now the club is facing the prospect of a second six-point deduction in as many seasons, imposed on them by the EFL on account of the club having failed to adhere to a business plan that was set out for them 14 months ago. The deduction would put Reading, who looked to be on the verge of their first season of mid-table mediocrity and first tension-free run in in living memory, down to 21st in the championship table, just one place above the relegation zone, having picked up only eight points from their previous 10 games. There is an old expression in English, sometimes deemed to be ironic, that quote, may you live in interesting times. Well, Reading fans could be forgiven at this stage for having been quite keen on some tedium and obscurity, rather than chaos and nail-biting. Manager Paul Ince has described the latest revelations as a black cloud hanging over our heads, ahead of games against Millwall, Blackburn and Hull, three teams above Reading in the championship table, before the points deduction has even taken effect. Following over a year's worth of requests then, it seemed to me to be high time that I gave Reading the what on earth is going on treatment. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Reading, you lucky buggers, commonly mispronounced as Reading due to its spelling by those outside of Britain, a market town famous for its biscuits, brewing, and for being the scene of the only significant battle of the Glorious Revolution, which was the last successful invasion of England in 1688, as we take a look at how a team, once fabulously nicknamed the Biscuit Men, have gone from being the archetypal well-run town football club, to a total car crash of a club, spending wildly beyond their means, and lurching constantly from calamity to cataclysm, with barely enough time for supporters to catch their breath. Throughout most of their history, Reading have been a lower league club. Founded in 1871, the Royals are the third oldest club in the EFL, but they didn't actually join the Football League until 1920. In 1926, Reading won their first promotion, but they were relegated five years later, and it would take another 55 years before Reading returned to the second tier of English football in the 1986-87 season, only managing to stick around for two seasons before they were promptly relegated once again. Things got so bleak for Reading that in the early 1980s, at which point the club's attendances regularly slumped below 3,000, Czech-born British media baron Robert Maxwell, a notorious fraudster, suspected spy, and the father of convicted sex trafficker Gillen Maxwell, attempted to merge the club with Oxford United and rename the new franchise as Thames Valley Royals. It was, if you like, MK Dons a couple of decades before MK Dons. Maxwell claimed that both clubs were facing serious financial problems, which was probably true, and that a merger was the only solution, which very clearly wasn't. Maxwell already owned Oxford United at the time, whilst Reading were a public limited company, with Maxwell owning 19% of their shares. The former MP was proposing that Oxford would acquire the remainder of Reading's shares, buying the club out, and paving the way for his Thames Valley Royals creation, who would play their home games at an unspecified location somewhere between Oxford and Reading, possibly did cut. Unlike in the case of MK Dons, opposition from both sets of supporters proved to be successful. Despite Maxwell once claiming that nothing short of the end of the earth would scupper his plans, in the end it was Reading directors Roy Tranter and Roger Smee who prevented the deeply unpopular merger from ever becoming a reality. 
the following season, Reading won promotion, and they haven't played fourth tier football since. Oxford United, meanwhile, won back-to-back -back promotions to the top flight of English football for the first time in their history under Maxwell, sticking around for three seasons but just missing out on the untold riches of the Premier League. Despite Oxford's success, Maxwell still tried, unsuccessfully, to buy Manchester United in 1984, and three years later, he resigned as Oxford chairman and bought Derby County. Local businessman John Medeski had tried to buy Reading in the 1980s, but Maxwell rejected his offer of £5 a share. When Maxwell died, somewhat mysteriously, his naked body recovered from the Atlantic Ocean after he had supposedly fallen from his yacht in the Canary Islands in November 1991, Reading were taken into receivership. Mirejski, a lifelong fan of the club who had become Reading's chairman in 1990, revived his interest in acquiring the club upon Maxwell's death, and he was able to do so for a price of just 10 pence a share. Reflecting on Maxwell's death and his cut price takeover as a result, Mirejski is quoted as having said, Funny old life, isn't it? At the time, Reading were a mid-table side in the old 3rd Division, soon to be renamed the 2nd Division following the breakaway of the Premier League, with tiny attendances and very little money. Mirejski had made his own fortune by founding Auto Trader, then a popular car sales magazine and now Britain's leading automotive online marketplace, along with a series of other publications under the name Hearst Publishing. Mirejski's early years at Reading were a roaring success. Second Division champions in 1994 and First Division runners-up in 1995, in any ordinary season that would have earned the club back-to-back -back promotions, and a ticket to the top flight of English football for the first time in the history of the club, but a restructuring of the league in the 1994-95 season meant that they were denied automatic promotion and instead went into the playoffs. After comfortably beating Tranmere Rovers in the playoff semi-finals, Reading raced into a 2-0 lead against Bolton in the playoff final at Wembley, but went on to lose the game 4-3 in extra time. It was a bitter pill to swallow, and the following season they finished 19th. In 1998, the same year that Medeski and his business partner Paul Gibbon sold Hearst Publishing to BC Partners for £260 million, Reading were relegated to the third tier of English football. The timing couldn't have been much worse, as Reading were just about to move into a new 24,161 capacity stadium built to meet Mirejski's aims of making Reading a Premier League club. Named in his honour, the majority of the funding for the Mirejski stadium had been provided by the man himself, and it took Reading four seasons to get back to what is now the Championship. It took another four years, and, crucially, the appointment of Steve Coppel in 2003 for Reading to finally reach the promised land of the Premier League. When they did so, in the 2005-06 season, they did it in some style. Reading won a stunning 32 games that season, and lost only two, amassing 106 points in total, which is the most that any team has managed, not just in the Championship, but in the entire history of professional football in England. At that point, Mirejski considered his work to be done, putting the club up for sale and commenting that, despite having realised all of his goals at Reading, unless you were a billionaire, the Premier League was a waste of time. Koppel and his team did their best to prove Mirejski wrong the following season, after he had failed to find a suitable buyer, as Reading enjoyed one of the best ever campaigns for a newly promoted team in the Premier League, finishing 8th in the division above the likes of Manchester City, and only missing out on a European place by a single point. The following season came to be known as the most extreme case of second season syndrome of the Premier League era though, as Reading plummeted 10 places and were relegated on the final day of the season. Following two failed playoff campaigns, in January 2012, Mirejski felt that he had finally found his perfect successor in the form of Anton Zingarevich. The son of a Russian billionaire a couple of times over, Zingarevich had been sent to a private school in Berkshire, where he watched Reading at their old home ground Elm Park. 
Anton's father Boris made his billions in the paper and pulp business when the Soviet Union collapsed, and state-owned enterprises were sold for pennies on the pound, or copex on the ruble, if you will. Boris and Anton had previously tried to buy Everton in 2004, but Mirescu was sold on the combination of billionaire wealth and at least a tenuous link to the club. The magazine tycoon was able to go out on a high, as Reading won the championship title and were therefore promoted to the Premier League under Brian McDermott in the 2011-12 season, amassing another almighty tally of 89 points before the sale was completed at the end of the season. There was lots of excitement when Zingarovic arrived, not least because the club had just won promotion, but Reading's transfer business was relatively modest, and their marquee arrival, notably, was a compatriot of their new owners in the form of Russian international Pavel Pogrebniak. In March 2013, with Reading languishing in the relegation zone, Zingarovic sacked McDermott, but Nigel Adkins was unable to turn the Royals' fortunes around as the club finished 19th. Zingarovic, who now owns Bulgarian side Botev Plovdiv, was barely seen at Medeski Stadium after that point, and in 2014 he resigned from the Reading board, handing control of the club back to Medeski. Reading were in serious trouble at this point, and Medeski has admitted to having been unsure as to what their fate would have been, had a Thai consortium led by Lady Sasima Srivakorn, a singer and composer in her 70s, not come in for the club. Mirejski gave a glowing assessment of Lady Sasima, but this was to be a strange period for the club, as indeed has been most of the last decade. Having inherited a team that, whilst troubled off the pitch, had only finished one point and one place outside of the championship playoff places the previous season, the Thai trio made some very unusual decisions. The backbone of the team that had just finished 7th the previous season, goalkeeper Alex McCarthy, captain Joby McEnough, and top scorer Adam LaFondra all departed, amongst others. Meanwhile, Anton Ferdinand was brought in from Police United of the Thai Premier League, whose CEO was part of the consortium that acquired a 90% stake in Reading. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, Reading were rubbish the following season, in which they finished 19th after sacking Nigel Adkins before Christmas. His replacement, Steve Clark, also wouldn't make it through to the following Christmas, as Brian McDermott was brought back to replace him midway through the 2015-16 campaign. During this time, Reading's wage bill was rising steadily, and their recruitment was broadly speaking a disaster, typified by the massive £2.5 million loan fee that was paid for Mate Vidra, who scored just three goals in 31 league games that season. McDermott was sacked at the end of the season, having finished 17th, and replaced by Yap Stam. The following season actually started pretty well under Stam, as one of the Thai consortium's better signings, Jan Camorgan, couldn't stop scoring, but in the middle of November, Reading found themselves on the cusp of changing owners once again. It was out with the Thais and in with the Chinese, as Dai Yong and his sister Dai Shu Li agreed a deal to acquire a 75% stake in Reading. The brother and sister duo, who became Decca billionaires according to some, worth in excess of $20 billion through their business Ren Commercial Holdings Company Limited, had been on the verge of buying Hull City just three months earlier. Hull City's unpopular owners, the Alams, had accepted a £130 million bid from the duo following promotion to the Premier League, and they even attended the opening game of the Tigers' 2016-17 season, in which they beat the reigning Premier League champions Leicester City, wearing Hull City merchandise and occupying the director's box. Yong had even paid the Alams a £6 million deposit and declared his ambition to turn Hull City into one of the strongest clubs in England. But less than two weeks later, the deal collapsed, reportedly after the Premier League indicated to the Alam family that Yong and Shu would be unable to pass the owners and directors test. Undeterred, the duo tried their hand at buying a championship club instead, hoping that the EFL's fit and proper person test would be somewhat more lenient. 
They were proven right in that assessment. And in May 2017, the Football League announced that they had no objections to the takeover being completed. Young and Shu very nearly bought a Premier League club, and I'm not referring to Hull City there, as Stam's side finished third in the championship that season, only falling at the final hurdle in the playoff final against Huddersfield Town on penalties. Seeing just how close Reading had come, the club's new owners decided to throw money at the club in the hope of securing promotion the following season. Sonny Aluko was signed for a fee of £7.5 million, Vito Minone and Mudu Barrow signed for a further £5 million, and the club's already large wage bill by championship standards jumped further still to £35 million. The following season, Yapstam was sacked and replaced by Paul Clement, and Reading only narrowly avoided relegation, finishing just three points above the drop. Spending skyrocketed, just as Reading's revenue rapidly declined, the latter falling from £37 million to £18 million in the new owner's first season in charge, which meant that Reading's wage to turnover percentage exploded from 76% in the 2016-17 season, in which Reading reached the playoff final, to an eye-watering 197% in the 2017-18 season, in which they finished 20th. Those figures weren't remotely sustainable, despite the wealth of Reading's owners, as a result of the division's profit and sustainability rules, but by far the worst was still to come. Young and Shu kept on spending, not so much on transfer fees but on wages, bringing in high earners like Sam Baldock, John O'Shea, and David Marler over the summer, which meant that even a slight increase in revenue didn't change the fact that Reading was still paying twice their total revenue on wages alone before accounting for any of the club's other expenses. To make matters even worse still, they finished 20th in the division yet again, just seven points above the drop this time around. At this point, you might have thought that a change of tact would have been wise, but Reading's Chinese owners disagreed, and decided to double down. Romanian international Georgia Pushkash was signed in a club record deal, worth a potential 10 million euros from Inter Milan, Lucas Joao left Sheffield Wednesday behind in a deal worth £5 million, and the likes of Michael Morrison, Charlie Adam, and Rafael Cabral put a further burden on Reading's already massively bloated wage bill. Losses for the 2019-20 season climbed to a record £42 million, following £51 million losses over the course of the previous two campaigns. Given that championship clubs are permitted to lose no more than £39 million over any three-year period, you can see why Reading landed themselves in a fair bit of trouble. Those spending restrictions were actually relaxed to a four-year monitoring period as a result of COVID-19, but things didn't get any better for Reading, whose wage to turnover percentage actually peaked in the 2020-21 season at a quite frankly astonishing 234%, and an improved league finish of seventh place and a brief flirtation with the playoffs didn't prevent the Royals from losing a further £36 million for the campaign. The 2020-21 season was almost like a last chance saloon for Reading, who threw the kitchen sink at promotion, but ended up falling short, stuck in the championship, with their tail between their legs. Over the summer of 2021, Reading were put under a transfer embargo by the EFL, or a transfer ban, as it is more commonly referred to, which meant that they could only sign loan players and free transfers, and even then, only if those signings were approved by the EFL. High earners like Sonia Luco and Sam Baldock's contracts were allowed to expire, Danny Drinkwater and Tom Ince's low moves came to an end, star man Michael Alise was cashed in on in a move to Crystal Palace, and later Georgia Pushkash was allowed to go out on loan to Syria B-side Pisa. In November 2021, following a mixed but overall relatively positive start to the season, given the off-pitch recruitment situation, Reading were hit with a six-point deduction by the EFL. 
The initial ruling was actually a 12-point deduction, as had been handed out to Derby County only a couple of months earlier. But the authorities were more lenient with Reading than they had been with Derby, reportedly on account of the Royals, having been more transparent about their accounts, cooperating with the EFL's investigation, and admitting to having broken the league's rules. The EFL didn't so much reduce Reading's punishment as delay it, however, deducting them only six points last season, but maintaining that if they didn't fully abide by the business plan that the league had imposed upon them, then they would be deducted the remaining six points this season. The implication, therefore, of the recent news that Reading are to be deducted a further six points, according to several reports, which Paul Ince said he expects to take effect around the same time that this video comes out, is that Reading have somehow contravened some condition or another of the EFL's business plan. That has come as a bit of a shock to Reading fans and to several onlookers, given that the club's every move has been watched like a hawk for the last 18 months. Since Reading's transfer embargo, every one of their loan and free transfer signings has had to be assessed and granted approval by the EFL. The likelihood, therefore, is that Reading are either being punished for having failed to offload players in order to adequately reduce their outgoings and bring them in line with the profit and loss targets set out in the EFL's business plan, or the league believes that they are no longer being fully honest with their accounting and is punishing them on those grounds. Predicting which of those two it is, at this stage, would be pure speculation, but rather than coming out fighting, Paul Lintz, at least, seemed to be fairly resigned to whatever fate might befall the club and did not appear to have any qualms about the reasons for their potential six-point deduction. Reading do still have several high earners on their books, most notably Liam Moore, who earns a reported £30,000 a week, plus four players on a supposed £15,000 a week, one of whom, Pushkash, has gone out on loan again this season to Genoa, who are believed to be covering his wages for the duration of the loan. Offloading Liam Moore, given his age, salary, injury record, and indeed recent form, would be a nigh on impossible task. So if he is the cause of Reading's woes, it would be pretty harsh. Of course, within the grand scheme of things, they have only got themselves to blame. No football club is an island, well, except for Mallorca, I suppose, but it's important to note that what has happened at Reading has not happened in isolation. Yong and Shu's initial investment in 2017 came in the context of a raft of Chinese companies and billionaires buying up European football clubs on the direction, if not outright orders, of President Xi. Ren Commercial Holdings, Yong and Shu's business, has built shopping centres or shopping malls in over 30 different Chinese cities out of disused air raid shelters, agreeing a massive government contract with the Chinese military. The company went public in 2008, following rapid expansion, making the brother and sister duo billionaires overnight, with Yong's net worth peaking at $26 billion in 2021, according to the Huron Rich List. Other outlets do cite considerably lower figures, it should be said. In 2012, as China began to ramp up investment in football, Ren Commercial Holdings bought Chinese outfit Shanxi Baorong Chamber, relocating the club to Guangzhou and renaming them Guangzhou Ren before another move two years later to Beijing and another rebrand to Beijing Ren. In 2020, following a second relegation in only two seasons, which saw the club go from the Chinese Super League to the lowly third tier of Chinese football, Beijing Ren, briefly renamed Beijing Cheng Feng after company names were banned from the names of football clubs in China, was dissolved. In the same summer that Yong bought Reading, he also bought Belgian club KSV Hozalar, who had just missed out on promotion to the Belgian Pro League in the playoff final. Mirroring his mismanagement at Reading, Yong threw 12 million euros at Hozalar in his first summer in charge, a quite frankly obscene amount of money in Belgium's second tier, but due to the reckless manner in which it was spent, they still failed to win promotion. 
in 2020, KSV Hoselaar, just like Beijing Ren, were declared bankrupt and dissolved. The omens for Reading, on that front at least, aren't particularly good. The Chinese government and Xi Jinping are no longer encouraging Chinese businesses and billionaires to invest in overseas football clubs. In fact, they are now encouraging the precise opposite, as I covered in a recent video, hence why we have seen so many Chinese owners sell up in recent years, and no new investment. Contrary to that pattern, and despite just how badly things have gone, Yong has expressed no interest, publicly at least, in selling Reading, and he has repeatedly reiterated his commitment to the club. That makes Yong an outlier then, unless it is all smoke and mirrors, but there is little indication that is the case, and virtually no talk of a takeover at the club. By the same token, it is quite difficult to see who exactly would want to buy Reading at this moment in time, especially with £100 million plus of debt currently on their books. To reiterate his commitment to the club, Yong made a rare appearance at Reading's defeat to Sheffield United earlier this week, their first match following news of a further six-point deduction. Of the Reading fans that I've talked to, opinion on Yong and the current ownership, whilst broadly negative and naturally apprehensive, is still somewhat split. Almost all agree that the club's owners are woefully incompetent and have dreadfully mismanaged the team's finances, but whether there is any malicious intent or not is an entirely different question. Yong has invested a small fortune in Reading, even as someone with an enormous personal fortune, and he stands to gain nothing from the club, going backwards or even worse. There is also dissatisfaction amongst some, not just at Reading, at the EFL's profit and sustainability rules. Few doubt that the club broke the league's spending rules, but at the same time, there is little to suggest that Yong is ever likely to be unable to meet those spending commitments, or that their debt, which is primarily owed to him and his business, is ever likely to be recalled. There is an ongoing debate in football, around all FFP restrictions, of whether there ought to be a mechanism for teams with wealthy owners, who are willing to put money into a club, with no intention of ever getting it back, to be able to do so, if they are somehow able to guarantee that their spending will never leave the club high and dry. That Yong knows very little about football, there is no debate. Two out of the three clubs he has owned no longer exist, and the other is about to be docked another six points, and has been under a transfer embargo for the best part of two years. It is hardly a glowing CV. I cited Yong's $26 billion net worth, according to the Huron Rich list in 2021 a moment ago, but other sources have cast doubt on whether Reading's brother and sister duo are worth a fraction of that amount, and Ren Commercial Holdings has a record of financial difficulties and of over-leveraging debt. To address his lack of knowledge about football, Yong has long sought the advice of others, most notably Kia Jurabchan, a man whose name sends shivers down the spine of football fans the length and breadth of Britain. Jorab Chan isn't a licensed football agent, but he has been advising players and clubs for almost 20 years, first coming to notoriety as a result of his involvement in controversial transfers involving Carlos Tevez and Javier Mascherano. Jorab Chan has since been involved, largely unofficially, with Newcastle United, Everton and Reading, at a time when all three were hardly renowned for being expertly run clubs. For that reason, Jurab Chan's involvement with a club tends to be greeted with displeasure amongst supporters, and even active protests in the case of Everton. According to The Athletic, Yong is very close to Jurab Chan, and Reading's business, at least their first few years under Chinese ownership, was heavily influenced by him. Reading's head of recruitment, Seb Yuan, notably spent three years working for Jurab Chan's agency before landing a job at the dreadfully renamed Select Car Leasing Stadium in December 2018. Since Paul Ince came in, it seems as though Reading have sought better advice, with the appointment of Mark Bowen as head of football operations, Brian Carey as director of recruitment, and Jared Dublin as head of scouting amongst others, 
all highly experienced football people who ought to give Reading a better grounding moving forward. At least, if they manage to get over this current hurdle, meanwhile Ince has done a commendable job given the circumstances, closer points-wise to the playoffs than the bottom three, despite not having had any money to spend, at least prior to the latest six-point deduction. The other context that one cannot overlook is that of the Wild West and ludicrous house of cards that is the Skybet Championship. Reading are by no means the first club to spend wildly more than they generate in income, nor will they be the last. Most seasons, there are several championship clubs who put their house on promotion to the Premier League, despite the knowledge that only three can pull it off. Sometimes it works, and they escape scot-free, but most of the time they don't. There is also a particular trend of recklessness among losing playoff finalists. Reading were losing playoff finalists in 2017 and have since been beset by crises, but a similar fate has been met by the likes of Derby County, Sheffield Wednesday, and if you go back a little bit further, Leeds United, who were losing championship playoff finalists in 2006. All three of those clubs were rapidly relegated to League One. Reading have so far dodged that bullet, but only by the skin of their teeth. In the 2020-21 season, the last season with a complete set of accounts, all but four championship clubs spent in excess of 100% of their revenue on wages alone. Ten spent more than 150% and five spent over 200%. That is absolutely insane and only two of them, Brentford and Nottingham Forest, are now in the Premier League. It is not a remotely sustainable situation, and until it is addressed, we will see more Reddings, more Sheffield Wednesdays, and more Derby Counties. Reading have spent a fortune under the ownership of Dai Yong, who is himself said to be an avid gambler at London's high-end private members clubs. You could say that he's got a bit of a live-fast Dai Yong attitude. <laughs> but what have they got to show for it? A transfer ban, a 12-point deduction, and a strike partnership of Andy Carroll and Shane Long, which, admittedly, would have torn the championship a new one in 2010-11, but that's 12 years ago, they now have a combined age of 70, and Long has scored just one goal in 25 league games so far this season. Reading have gone from being a club that cut their cloth accordingly and overachieved through smart recruitment and shrewd management, to a rudderless mess throwing money around aimlessly for years, amassing an enormous wage bill with players who could rarely justify their extortionate salaries whilst letting some genuine talent slip through their fingertips for very little. Jack Stacey and Rob Dickey, who now star for Bournemouth and Queen's Park Rangers, were allowed to leave for nothing, or almost nothing. Mikel Antonio pocketed the club less than £1 million, and even someone like Michael Alise, a rare success story at Reading in recent years, was sold far too cheaply for just £8.37 million as the result of a buyout clause written into his contract. Reading don't even own their own stadium anymore, John Medeski's pride and joy, which the current owners bought for £26.5 million a few years ago, to dodge falling foul of profit and sustainability rules at the time, prompting an EFL investigation. It's an accounting trick which became increasingly common over a number of years in the championship, before new rules were introduced in order to combat it, but whilst it worked, for want of a better word, for some clubs, we saw the potential pitfalls at Derby when Mel Morris came to relinquishing control of the club, and it is an asset which, you know, can only be sold once regardless. Reading are now paying £1.5 million a season to their own owners to lease the use of a stadium that the club built in 1998. Reading travel to Millwall tomorrow and probably need another three wins this season to guarantee their survival, regardless of their six-point deduction. Once again, though, it feels as though the biggest battle for the club might be off the pitch rather than on it, as a period of calm continues to elude what was once the finest team that the championship has ever seen. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Well, you, you probably didn't if you're a Reading fan, mind, but, you know, for everyone else. 
Hit the like button if you did enjoy it, whether you are a Reading fan or otherwise. It is much appreciated. Apparently, it helps in some capacity. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both HITC7s and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now. Uh, you can also find me on either Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.